As part of the Shenmue Dojo 20th birthday celebrations, we bring to you an exciting new interview with a key man involved in getting Shenmue 3 off the ground and into our hands last year. He worked for Kojima Productions on Metal Gear Solid 4 and other Metal Gear Solid series titles. He has a long list of credits within the games industry on big name titles such as The Last Guardian and Smash Brothers. He was also a main driver in the 2012 Kickstarter campaign for the PC and PlayStation release for Public. His studio, Camouflage, also released the critically acclaimed Iron Man VR for PlayStation VR in July this year. That man is Ryan Payton. This interview took place on October 19, 2020 via Skype. We hope you enjoyed this interview and would like to thank Ryan personally for his time and contributions towards the Shenmue Dojo's 20th birthday celebrations. Um, okay, so my, my first question is, um, it's actually for the benefit of sort of the new people we found to the community in the last sort of year or so, is, uh, could you tell me a little bit about yourself, your work in the gaming industry to date, and any sort of notable titles you've worked on apart from Shenmue 3? Yeah, uh, yeah, the brief introduction of me is that uh, I got my start in the game industry uh, writing uh, articles for lots of different freelance uh, publications like Electronic Gaming Monthly, OneUp.com, Wire Magazine. I ended up getting a job uh, in Japan um, at Konami, uh, Kojima Productions, working on Metal Gear Solid um, 3 towards the end of that production, and then uh, all the way through Metal Gear Solid 4. Um, and uh, that, was a, that was a great honor. And then I, uh, I left, went back home to the, to the States, to the Seattle area, to be closer to the family. And that's when I, um, I was hired by Microsoft as creative director on Halo 4. I did that for two and a half, three years um, before I was let go. And then I started my own video game shop called The Camouflage. And I've been doing that for the past nine years, um, which is hard to believe. And we shipped uh, two games, uh, Republic and uh, and most recently Marvel's Iron Man VR. And all the way, um, just been, you know, connecting with lots of, with lots of developers around the world and, and trying to dis- discover ways I can help them out, uh, which obviously led me to... Uh, to working with somebody I know we're going to talk about on a franchise I know we're going to talk about. Yeah, very much so. Um, I, oh, thank you for that. It's very it's sort of interesting. I forgot you worked on Halo 4, actually. I knew about the Metal Gear Solid um, work you did. So I forgot you worked on Halo. What, what was working on Halo like, just briefly? Mm. Well, working on Halo was a, a dream come true. I, I love the first Halo game. I love the Halo franchise. And then as a 28 year old um, being told that you're going to be creative director on uh, the sequel to Halo 3 uh, was a was a very big day in my life. Um, and uh, and I took it very seriously. And but it was a really difficult and challenging uh, environment that we were in. Um, not to anybody's fault, really. It's just the fact that Bungie, as you as you probably remember, had had spun off of Microsoft. Uh, and then Microsoft quickly realized that they don't have anybody to develop new Halo games for. And so they decided to build an internal studio, which eventually would become known as 343 Industries. And I was probably the 11th, 12th member of that of that um, group that now is many, many hundreds of people. Wow. So it's literally from the ground up. Yes. Yes. Wow. And it was very exciting. And uh, yeah, I put I put so much of my heart and soul into that project, as as did a lot of other people. Uh, and I'm really proud of the game. Uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't there to ship it, which I'm really sad about. But um, a lot of the things that we were excited about, uh, and the story, the story that we wanted to tell, and the ambitions of the team, it's despite the fact that they've never developed a Halo game uh, on that tech <laughs> ever, uh, is is quite remarkable. So I think there's a lot to be proud of for that game, despite its flaws. Thanks. That sounds really, really good. Actually, it's appropriate talking about Halo because obviously we're going back in time. <laughs> And I'm going yes, all the way back in so. time with, with this next question is um, I want to ask you sort of, not just about Shenmue, but also the Dreamcast. Like how did you come across the Dreamcast? Then later on Shenmue, what, what brought you and attracted you towards the platform and later on Shenmue itself? Hmm. Well, I was enraptured by the Sega Dreamcast. Uh, and I don't know, ex- I don't remember exactly why it was because I was definitely more of a PlayStation guy. Uh, and I didn't get a Saturn until much later, uh, but there was something about the ambition, I think, of what Sega was looking to do uh, that really, really spoke to me. Uh, and I remember September 9th, 1999, 
uh, because my my dad and I talk about it quite a lot because I was a college student uh, when the Dreamcast came out and I had one reserved uh, down in the Portland area uh, so I could save on taxes. But I went to end up going to school in Seattle, which is about a three hour drive. So when on September 9th, 1999, I ended up skipping skipping school that day. Uh, and driving down the interstate to Portland to go pick up my my Sega Dreamcast for launch day, and uh, and uh, <laughs> this is before like my <laughs> cell phone and everything. But I apparently I drove really fast down uh, uh, past my dad who was also driving on the interstate, and I was totally busted because um, by the time I got I got back home, he's like, "Hey, what'd you do today?" I was like, "Oh, you know, just you know, normal stuff." <laughs> and he's like, "You." You went somewhere, didn't you? I was like, yes, Dad. And uh, yeah, he totally, he totally got me. But it was totally worth it, and totally in love. I was really in love with the with the Dreamcast. Oh, so much to the point where at a certain point, I was convinced that I was, and I actually started working on. It. I was going to write a book about the history of the Sega Dreamcast, and I was starting to collect quotes from developers. Oh, um, that's the, that's that's the level of, um, of of dedication and and just absolute love I had for that for that console. And what did you pick up at launch, if you don't mind my asking? Oh no, yeah, I don't mind at all. I, I picked up uh, I picked up Soul Calibur, and oh, yes. I also picked up um, Final Fantasy VIII for PlayStation One, uh, which was both both came out the same day. Um, and I remember just having I was juggling between the two, you know, which was pretty good, right? You have your story driven game on on PlayStation, and then you had your 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 battler. Um, and again, I was at college, so it was a great game to just have people come into my my dorm room and and play. It was just just a great game. Yeah, especially consider the cutting edge, cutting edge technology at the time as well. I bet people coming in like, oh my, wait, what's this? This is amazing. You know, Soul Calibur holds up today, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, just thinking about the other games that was after launch, but another game that was a huge hit within the dorms was Crazy Taxi. We ended up having like a whiteboard and we we're all writing up all our different scores. And I got really, really, really into that game. Yeah, I love that game, and the soundtrack on that is 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 among my favorite. Oh, it's great! Of all time, <laughs> um, so good. yeah, loved it. So then, sort of going into obviously, you you expressed your love for the Dreamcast, and then so when did you hear about Shenmue, and, and how did that come about? Well, there was the various video game magazines I grew up reading and loving, and wanting to write for one day. Uh, which I was able to, and that was that's that's always been really special to me. Uh, and the the official Dreamcast magazine was always talking about, as you know, the Virtual Fighter RPG, which I found to be really really intriguing. Just that that just that idea. That's all you need to put is Virtual Fighter RPG. I'm in, right? And it was going to star Akira, as you know. And so I've really followed the the story of what would eventually become Shenmue um, extremely closely, or Project Berkeley, right? Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I. I just followed every single bit of news I could all leading up all the way through to launch. Uh, and I made sure that I had a, a, a launch Japanese copy on its way imported uh, to Seattle. And at the time I was already studying Japanese for a number of years, uh, but I really put my Japanese skills to the test by playing through the game um, on my modded Dreamcast uh, through in, in Japanese. And that was, that was one of my f- most favorite video game experiences of my life, I have to say, is playing through that game like that. And uh, you were studying Japanese. How much of it did you understand? Because <laughs> I know if I tried that, it, it wouldn't go very well. Well, I I learned the hard way, way that, in, and, I, and I know with your background, you, you probably know this to be true, is that um, you know, there's only so far you can go with education before you need to start applying it in the real world. And yeah. um, I remember being surprised and, and disheartened early on when I was studying Japanese that I didn't understand a lot of what these characters were saying in, in lots of different Japanese video games, not just Shenmue. Um, but the nice thing about Shenmue was that it, it, you know, had, it had full voiceovers, right? Mm, so yeah. even if I couldn't read the kanji, I could hear what they're saying. And I was picking up a lot of the different conversational things that they're repeating over and over and over again. So in a way, I, was, I w- re- truly was learning a lot of Japanese by playing the game. Uh, and and I w- which I would eventually apply to when I when I when I moved over there uh, several years after the fact. Fantastic! That's really interesting to know because I I know that um, one of our other sort of community groups, Phantom River of Stone, and um, started doing a, a piece around um, Jap- learning Japanese through Shenmue. Actually, so it's mm-hmm. quite apt that you've done that yourself in some respects. Um, so I did it exactly that way. Yes. 
Yes, that's, that's very that's interesting to hear because I know um, James, who co owns a dojo with me, is learning Japanese at the moment. And he said it's it's quite, he's picking it up, but there's so much Good. to it. I mean, it's beyond me at the moment. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, no, that's fantastic. So let's talk about the game atmosphere. Obviously, at the time, as we know, it was, there was nothing like it at the time. It, it really broke all sorts of games boundaries i start thinking about when i played like legend of zelda or karina tony mm-hmm. in 64 it was a massive game but it wasn't set in the real world shenmue in, in my view was the first real triple a title if you like so how did it sort of break ground for you in terms of gameplay in terms of atmospherics in terms of the music in terms of the way it presented itself compared to what was on the market at that time well, I think like a lot of people, and partially because Yu Suzuki was behind the game, and partially probably because it was initially discussed as a virtual virtual fighter RPG, is I went to the game intrigued by the story, but very excited to have an RPG that is driven by those really solid virtual fighter fighting mechanics. And I remember being somewhat disappointed by the fact that it's just not as in depth as the as the virtual fighter games right yeah and so but but the good news is that despite my disappointment what ended up filling that void of what i was looking for out of this game was this the atmosphere and as you were mentioning matt like the 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 everyday lifestyle <laughs> activities that you have as as real right um and i found myself just being completely enamored by um feeling like i was back in japan which again is a very different experience and I know that a lot of people had, um, especially in the West when they first played Shemo, they didn't have that 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 experience to draw upon. But again, in my own personal life, I had the I had the opportunity to uh, be an exchange student when I in Japan when I was in high school. And uh, so I remember walking around um, neighborhoods that are very similar to the Yokosuka uh, neighborhood that, that you have in Shemu one. And so and you know I just just loving the smells, loving the way that it just being fascinated by the different objects that they had in their houses, like how their, their dresser drawers were different and how their, their telephones were different. And so just being able to live in that world and just like the, having just so much fun with the mon- mundane aspect of, of Japanese life uh, to me was just so interesting that uh, it really did fill the void that I think like the lack of depth and the fighting mechanics uh, that left, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things for me when I first played it, and I was I was fourteen at the time, it was just around my fourteenth birthday. I picked mm. it up. Uh, my parents got it for me, and I knew a bit about it. Um, I'd followed it in in the Dreamcast UK magazine, um, but and I knew it was a, a virtual fighter RPG. But that was about it, really. So I went in almost with a blank canvas, if you like, of what I didn't know what to expect, and what. I think resonated with me was like you say it's it's the atmosphere it's the mundane things that I could go and do what I wanted within the game and uh, you know in the year 2000 when we got mm. it it that was unheard of and for me it, it captured the imagination not just about Japan but in terms of storytelling in terms of the way the game was presented in terms of the way the characters were presented and it, it really resonated with me so I remember um, finishing Shenmue 1 <laughs> thinking well i want more come on wait, 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 where's more not knowing there was a sequel <laughs> which sounds really silly now but at the time i didn't know so mm. I, I was instantly the moment i finished shenmue one i was like right when's shenmue two coming out I, I, I must know and we were lucky in the uk that we got it Nate, we got it um it was published over here but you did yes in the us um unfortunately they didn't and were you one of the people that imported it over? Oh, you better believe I did. <laughs> and just before we sort of move on into sort of talk, meeting Yuzuki and all the rest of it, um, if how would you compare Shenmue 1 to Shenmue 2? And do you have a favourite? Mm. Well, I do think that Shenmue 2 is the better game. Uh, and I played through it fairly recently yeah when it was remastered um oh yeah, yeah. Like Shenmue one and two remaster and i was i was I, kind of, I had a couple of takeaways which i was really surprised by um one is that i forgot how obtuse 
Shenmue 1 was in terms of where you're supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to like cheat a little bit and remind myself, like, what, who am I supposed to talk to? Like, what do I have to do? And I have to be here at this specific time. How did I figure this out before in Japanese? I have no idea. <laughs> um, and, and, but I also, uh, with, with Shenmue 2, I wasn't as just emotionally touched as maybe as I was when I first played Shenmue 2, especially in the final disc where you're with Shenhua mm -hmm. in the forest. It's still a really beautiful moment, but that was, when I played that originally, I was absolutely blown away. Absolutely blown away that that was just a big sequence in this AAA game that had no real gameplay other than walking around, a few running quick time events, saving a, a deer in the river, and just having this conversation with Shenhua. Um, it's Again, it, it didn't hit me as, as hard as it did when I was playing it originally, but I think that's just a, such a beautiful, um, just a beautiful game, beautiful moment. And uh, I, I really, really, I think I, I, think I love uh, both games, but I think maybe Shimbo 2 edges it out a little bit. Yeah, I think my opinion is probably very similar to yours, actually. I think mm. Shenmue 1 set everything up perfectly for me, and then Shenmue 2 just it, it, it knocked it out of the park in terms of the storytelling. And I think you're right about Guilin Disc 4. Um, being at that point, I was turning 15, I think. I, I didn't mm. appreciate Guilin at the time for what it was. It was only when I went back, sort of 18, 19, and played it, and you actually realise, I think, how daring that section is in terms yeah, of design. Right. Because, you, like you say, you, you're walking, you're talking, and there's a few QTEs here or there. And that's, you know, in essence, all that you do. But it's right. in the depth of the conversations, isn't it? It's in, in, in the depth of atmospherics, just talking to Shenhua and mm. getting to know her and getting to obviously the end of the game and the now infamous cliffhanger where <laughs> actually I'm wanting to know obviously more about the, Shen, the the prophecy around the mirrors, but I want to know more about Shenhua. I want to know mm -hmm. more about Bailu Village and and all the rest of it that was that came through those conversations. And I think actually when you play Shenmue 2 and go to Shenmue 3 back to back, it's, it's, it's a perfect setup. It flows fantastically for me into Shenmue mm -hmm. 3 but I, yeah that's just yeah, obviously just my opinion but as we're sort of on the I've brought into Shenmue 3 now um we'll talk about Yu Suzuki a bit when did you first meet him um how did it come about well it was I'm forgetting the the the, the, the years now that I'm getting older but it's <laughs> roughly around 2012 2013 and I remember I was having dinner with with Mark Cerny in Tokyo, um, and I was mentioning to him how I know I knew that he was a, a an acquaintance or a friend of Yu Suzuki, and I told him at a certain point I said, hey, you know, I really want to get in contact with him. He said, well, I'm more than happy to introduce you, but like, why do you want to get in contact with him? And I said, well, I just did a I completed a Kickstarter for my game studio's first title, Republic, and I'm convinced that if this is the this is the path for Yu Suzuki to continue his his legacy, um, and and thankfully like Mark Cerny agreed, and I and I told him a little bit more about it, which is that just as a fan, it's bothered me really, really, really bothered me that for so many years, um, Yu Suzuki was not able to to continue working on that on that franchise, and not knowing anything about him on a personal level, right? It's just as a as a fan of his and as a connoisseur of game development and 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 just in, just loving the industry i just can't imagine what it would be like to be him where you are maybe aside from shigeru miyamoto a video game development god right not just in yeah. japan but in the world right and the amount of power and influence that he had when he was at sega and i'm sure you've watched some of the Shenmue making of content yeah, where you absolutely. could just see him at the height of his power chain smoking in those dark rooms giving direction <laughs> to like a packed room for like 40 people and he's just like scrutinizing the smallest thing about this like early development build of Shenmue right and he's got this grandiose plan and it's, there's 11 chapters there's 16 chapters nobody knows how many chapters there are but it's an um, unbelievably big vision that he has and then Shenmue 1 as we all know comes out disappointing on the commercial side of things he thank thankfully was able to um 
build the rest of what he had, um, which was ended up becoming Shenmue 2, right? Um, yeah. Which was lot, largely made up of cut content from the original game. Uh, and then it, I don't, I don't know the particulars of it because um, I don't tend to ask him about these things. But I think just from the outside, you can tell Sega was basically they're they're not good financially, and they're also just not not willing to probably keep Yu Suzuki in that level, in that in that position of leadership anymore. So then he just kind of fades off into the sunset with a few, you know, he worked on a couple other smaller games, right? But yeah, and yeah. it just always bothered me. Just always bothered me. I remember telling Mark about that, and he's like, "Yeah, like, why don't you reach out to Yu Suzuki and tell him I said hi?" So he gave me his email email address, and um, I I emailed him, and I basically said, "Look, it's been bothering me for longer than you can imagine, probably longer than maybe, but maybe not as long as for you, um, that you haven't been able to continue this franchise, and I think you should." I think I have an idea for how you can make Shim three, and he writes back uh, and says, "Wait, who are you?" <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so then what ended up uh, happening over the course of many months is uh, different Skype calls, and then I eventually met him face to face at GDC, um, where we spent about a day and a half together, where I explained to him who I am really, and I ex- walked him through what Kickstarter is. And then he brought a bunch of materials uh, to, to, with him to San Francisco of all the original Shenmu documentation. And he just sat down with me and just said, hey, this is my plan. This is what I want to do. What do you think? And so, yeah, that's how we that's how we started meeting. And that was, yeah, many, what is that, six, no, that was like seven or eight years ago now. Was the Kickstarter a hard sell to him initially? Um, uh, it, it was because he didn't know what it was initially. He didn't know what Kickstarter was. And so he was obviously very skeptical. Um, but over time, I was able to kind of wear him down, which is basically what I do <laughs> every single time I'm meeting with him is I'm typically wearing him down <laughs> uh, to the point where, yeah, he, he ended up realizing that, yes, this is the right path. And, uh, and yeah, the, it was a whirlwind to get it to, to Kickstarter and have that success. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, as, as, as you know, um, and, and I'm sure as like some of your readers know, but um, yeah, I've just been kind of like this this shadow figure in the background, pushing, pushing, pushing along to try to get this this uh, get more chapters of this game completed. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll talk about the success of the Kickstarter in a minute. And um, I'm you, in, you, you know, I'm interested to know. Obviously, you brought over like the documentation from Shenmue as a whole. What is there anything in that that's uh, well? It depends whether you can talk about it or not, of course. But was there anything in there that stood out in terms of what's to come? You don't have to tell us what it is, but was there anything in there you think, wow, I didn't realize the story was going this way or that way? Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's the whole the tome is is is, is quite interesting, and I was so so happy and. And humbled by the fact that he shared that with me. Uh, as a fan of this franchise, I'm really excited for the stories that are yet to be told, and I really hope that he's able to tell them because I did. Yes, I saw and read a lot of really exciting stuff. Because, as, as I'm sure you know, within the Shenmue community, um, as fans like to speculate <laughs> quite a lot. Mm. And there's all sorts of theories going around as to where the story is going to go, whether it's going to be a redemption arc whether it's going to be something completely different. And it's it's interesting to know. I'd, I'd love to know if any of those theories that are out there are true or not. You don't have to comment. I, I just know it's a personal interest for me as to whether anything well, that fans have said is true. And that's where well, it may thank, go. Thankfully, I can plead ignorance because I don't typically dive into the fan theory side of things. Um, okay. I find uh, that I... I typically focus on more of the the fans like reaction to like what's happening at that moment in time, right? Yeah. Um, and, like what's the reaction to this trailer or what's the action reaction yeah. to Shenmue 3, for example. And I wrote up a huge report based on that and, and shared it with Yu Suzuki. So yeah, but in terms of like forward thinking things, like yeah, I have a I have actually have a very, very clear sense for what I think the community wants out of the next game. But yeah. I don't I don't really typically read like story arc. Uh, theories okay. and maybe i should but I, yeah i really don't do that i think in some respects it's probably good you haven't <laughs> <laughs> there's sure all there's sorts... good ones out there no, there's some sure there's are. some really there, there's some really really good ones out there i just uh, for me personally i i when eventually hopefully show me four comes i want to see i want i want to find out for myself i i, mean, I am envious that you've seen things that are yet yet to come but i'm also sat there going as a as a, as a fan going i can't wait to find out what comes next Mm. And I think that's yes. 
part of the reason I think we're, we're all so hooked on this franchise, actually, is we want to know what happens next. And that's the one thing that for all fans agree is that it's always had that. It's always been about sort of what happens next and it draws you in. It, it's fantastic storytelling, but I digress anyway. So well, gonna... let me tell you one, one more thing about that, Matt, before you go to your next question. Yeah, okay. Is that... And I don't think I'm revealing, I'm, I'm, I'm not revealing any kind of future plot stuff, but I think what's important maybe for the community to know is that it's not as if Yu Suzuki has this big tome of text that outlines every single moment from now until the very end. Mm -hmm. He doesn't. I mean, he's got, a, he's got a story and it's written in those characters and there's big moments and, and, and yeah, it's all very exciting, right? But he doesn't really go into the, he doesn't take it to the next level in terms of level of detail until he starts working on that. And, uh, on that specific game and uh and so a lot of the things that um that were built for Shenmue 3 were created during the development of that some story threads a lot of characters were created during the development so and I I, I only bring that up because I think before I was exposed to that um, level of detail I kind of thought that he had maybe every single game mapped out to level to the point where he had the mechanics figured out and every single location figured out and it, it wasn't to that level of detail it's interesting because I think a wide, a wide speculation with the fan base is that the story is detailed, it is mapped out, he knows what he wants to do next, he knows what's what, as you say, mechanics are involved. It's interesting that actually there's a broad outline, but actually until that game starts getting worked on, that's when it gets fleshed out. So it's, that's quite a nice tidbit of information for us, actually. I think the community will love that. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, it's not like it's like a bullet point list. I mean, those are story, right? And mm. those characters and those dialogue, right? But those are mainly like the the, the high level, A A level story, if you will. Yeah. Right? But the B level and the C C level, like level of detail, like the sub characters and things like that are, are not are not developed in that in that in that material. Excellent. That's really nice to know. Okay, I'm going to go into the Kickstarter launch. Obviously, mm. you convinced you Suzuki to go ahead with this Kickstarter. Did it take much persuasion to Sony to say to them, look, this is what we're going to do. This is what we want to do. We're going to kickstart it. Was Sony receptive to the idea? Obviously, he came up on, on, on stage and they unveiled it. But what were those discussions like behind the scenes in terms of getting to that point that Yu Suzuki was on that stage in 2015 before that all really kicked into gear? Well, that, that actually, I don't know, I'll, I'll admit, is because I... I worked on the Kickstarter leading up to the to the point where we knew what the game was going to be, mm -hmm. and working on the materials with Yu Suzuki and his team, and working with Harry Morisha san who works uh, with him on the business side. Uh, and so I brought it up all the way to that point with him, and then it was him, Harry, and Sony, uh, like Adam Boys and, and, and that crew, uh, yeah. working towards uh, you know figuring out how yeah how E three was going to work and everything. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't in those meetings, and I'm so I, I'm not really privy to yeah the particulars of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know it, when it was a it, the, what I from what I can tell is that they were very receptive to that idea. Uh, they thought it was so bold, and uh, and yeah, I, I love that side of Sony where they're willing to do daring things like that. And uh, it was a big big success, and I was so happy for Yu Suzuki. I was there, you know, there with him, you know, that 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 day in L.A. when he showed up on stage can you just imagine like what a big moment that was for him uh, in his career you know having been dormant for so long right and then just seeing like the excitement um that that the fans had and then and then just seeing this guinness book of world records success that they had for the kickstarter was just absolutely awesome i remember it i i stayed up and watched it actually mm. and i remember sitting there going sony can't do any better and and then shenmue 3 yeah. turned up and everybody lost their minds um i remember I'll, I'll, my, my mobile phone was going crazy <laughs> oh i bet i bet yeah especially big for the site you know i have to imagine and I, i'll tell you one one tidbit i have is that i knew that you the key was excited right mm -hmm. and i know that he knew how important it was to keep the whole announcement secret and if I'm remembering this correctly, maybe four or five hours before the announcement or the day before the announcement, he's at he's at the convention center and he sees a forklift and he takes a photo <laughs> of it and he tweets it. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember, remember thinking, I was like, I think I might have been told. I was like, dude, I don't know if you should keep doing this because you don't want to ruin the surprise. Uh, but that's what I typically am doing. I'm usually like, do you really want to do this? So that's, that's, my, that's my role on the team. 
that was yeah i remember that tweet so then i was just an ordinary member of the, the, the dojo at that point and the place blew up everyone yes. was like we've got to watch e3 now and and obviously subsequently everybody was right um but i think after yes. years, years of disappointment i think it, the anticipation went into absolute fever pitch it was it was something out i've never experienced anything like it about a video game mm. and from from your point of view obviously when you, you're planning the kickstarter you're thinking like how well do you think it's going to go you know, where's it going to end up did you ever honestly anticipate that it was going to break world records that the reception for it would be absolutely mind-blowing that it basically broke the, the gaming internet for want of a better expression <laughs> did you really did you expect that kind of reaction to it well yes <laughs> to, to start off yes i absolutely thought it was going to smash work records and that's uh, i knew that years prior uh and so that's why i think i was such a a strong and compelling voice in his ear for so many for so long right leading up to that point uh i had that conviction and i have to say that he was right about that tweet i should say is that even though i was nervous about it i think what it did was it was a rally cry to the shenmu community that you need to pay attention to what's happening at e3 so i think he was right about that it didn't reveal too much yeah um, I think that and, but, right. and and also and this is neither here nor there but that was a really big day for me because um and not many people know about this, but not only on that day was Shenmue 3 announced, but The Last Guardian was re-revealed oh, yes, that day. And um, and I was also very instrumental in helping um, Fumito to get that game um, back on track and, and, and for the PlayStation 4 release of that game. And so both of those Japanese game creators who I have so much love and respect for, um, you know, getting seeing that level of excitement from fans was... Um, Really, just something that even to this day Rick, really warms my heart, and I was—I'm just really honored that I could be a part of both of those. It's, yeah, it was termed E3 of dreams for a reason, I think. And I mm. think personally, I played Last Guardian and absolutely loved it. Um, I'm digressing here, but I remember sitting at the end of the game, and actually, because there's not a lot of dialogue within that game, it's all mm. about the relationship between yourself and Trico and how it, how it builds up, and it's all through body language, it's all through expression. And I, 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 it captured my imagination in the same sort of way Shenmue did in the, the way it created its atmospherics and it built its characters yes. differently, but it had the same impact. And it's a game I hold, certainly for this generation, right up there as one of my absolute favourites. It was oh, it's, that's it's awesome to hear. A fantastic experience for, for me personally. So yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop now about that because I'll, I'll oh, go I know. I could talk, forever. I would love to talk to you about that another point. Yeah, about Last Guardian. It's, but yeah, play, please. Fantastic game, all the same. Um, okay, so we sort of, if we touch into sort of Shenmue 3's Kickstarter itself, obviously things have blew, blown up. It's gone absolutely crazy. How did that uh, sort of impact your workload around the Kickstarter, considering it, it was going, for want of a better expression, it went mad? How did that affect your workload of the Kickstarter and management of it, considering the, the sort of the, the, the scrutiny around it, shall we say, and, and, and the interest in it? Well, you know, maybe this is a good segue into talking about like my role within the group, right? Mm. Is that um, I really get to have the best of both worlds. I get to sit down with Yu Suzuki on a fairly regular basis, ask him how he's doing. He just shows me what he's working on and we just talk about it and I give some thoughts, feedback. Oftentimes it's from the perspective of, a, of just a hardcore fan. Um, and, and then I get to leave and I don't have to do the actual work. <laughs> so, and the, and the same is, is, is true of the Kickstarter, um, is that I, thank God, was not part of like the day-to-day -day of that, which I can't even imagine how stressful and how busy that was. But I was a voice of the, from the community about, hey, look, from what I can tell, as somebody who's not reading every single comment, these five things need to be addressed ASAP. And here's some ideas, like you could talk to this person, you can hire this person, maybe add some more clarity to this, to this tier or whatever. And I think generally speaking, Yu Suzuki has been very open-minded and really easy to work with. And his crew have, have always been really easy for me to work with. And so, um, yeah, that's like the level of, of involvement I had in the Kickstarter once it was announced, but leading up to it, very, I had a lot of conversations about what the game was actually going to be. And I, I probably shouldn't speak too much out of turn, but there was a lot of conversations about, you know, would it even be a kind of a more quote unquote 
normal Shimu game or would it be a very stripped down experience, right? Or mm. yeah, what would it be? And I, I remember we had lots of debates about that. And I'm, um, I'm really happy that he's, he, he was committed to, to, to building like a full experience. Yeah, I think I, just from my personal point of view, I, I, I was, I think you can't, I mean, it's, I, you can't please everybody with anything at the end of the day. And I think what he got out of what he had to do it is, is phenomenal, actually. You're considering two full voiceovers, two fully open world areas, a fighting system. I think there's a, a, a lot of credit there where it's where it's due. I think it's a fantastic achievement for what he had. And considering where he'd come from, from, literally back from the dead, for want of a better word, I think it, it's phenomenal. So within sort of development, obviously, like you say, you weren't involved in the, in the day-to-day development of, of the game, but are there any particular points during that development cycle that stand out to you as particular favourite moments that you that you can pinpoint? Hmm. Well, I'll, I don't know if they're favourite, but I'll just give you a couple snapshots of what are in, what are in my mind. Yeah. Uh, so typically what I do is I go visit WiseNet um, when I'm, uh, I'm in Japan on business. And which would be fairly frequent, and I would I would go up to their to their floor and check in with some friends, and, and I would sit down with Yu Suzuki at his at his desk, and then he's he to his credit he always has the game up and running. Um, he's not one of those kind of game creators that check out the game once a month or once a week. Like, he is always looking at the game, uh, maybe maybe to like the horror of like the, the development team, right? <laughs> and and like a like a like a school teacher, he's got like this long. Um, this this uh, kind of metallic stick that he has, this pointer, right? And he's mm-hmm. pointing to things on the screen, saying, "Move this box three centimeters this way," or "This shadow looks wrong," or "I don't really love the lighting here." What if you guys did this or this, right? And he's just, just constantly like scrutinizing the game, working on the game, improving the game, even from like two years before ship. And so I thought, just like seeing that, I thought was um, interesting. I, in fact. Um, I am probably speaking out of turn on this one, but I think he's going to be fine if I if I talk about this. But one, I remember one moment in particular. He was uh, building out the interior of the of the boat that you arrive on. Oh um, yeah, at at Niawu, is that right? Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, it was like this, it was like the bottom, the basement floor of that of that boat. And he was you know asking the team to move around different like machinery um, and stuff like that inside there. And they eventually never let the player even explore that area, right? But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I just remember him, just the level of scrutiny that he had. I thought that was really interesting. Thank um, you. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. No, no, please. I was going to say, it sort of reflects in some Shenmue as a whole, that, that attention to detail, those yes. finer things that maybe as a, as a casual player, you wouldn't always pick up on. But actually those finer details make Shenmue what it is, I think. I agree. I agree. And... Uh, and then also what makes Shamu what it is, is that I, maybe if, you're, if your community wants to blame me, this is totally fine. <laughs> uh, maybe, I, maybe I deserve it. But I remember one of the bigger arguments I got, in, uh, got, into him, got into with him was when I started to see the opening of the game uh, come together, where you have that long walk with Shenhua and, uh, coming in uh, as you're approaching the village. Yeah. And he gives, he gives me the controller. And he's like, no, play it. I'm like, okay, cool. I, so I, I I walk for maybe five seconds, and then it triggers a cutscene, and then I walk for another seven seconds, and it triggers another small scene with Shenhua, and then I walk, and it, it just does it over and over and over again. Yeah. And, it's, and I put the controller down. I'm like, okay, you son, we need to talk. <laughs> it's like, okay, what do you what are you, you going to complain about next? I said, well, this is really reminding me of like criticism that. Um, a game that I worked on had, which was Metal Gear Solid 4, which early on is like you move a little bit and then cutscene, and then you move a little bit and cutscene. Um, and, Shim- and Metal Gear Solid 3 had that as well. And I said, modern game development is really trying to prevent this. He's like, okay, okay. And so um, that actually, so to his credit, he removed that stuff. And I think you're, I think the players would, would it had, it had, if you had, had like an A-B test of the two, I think you'd prefer what he shipped with. But still, there are some flaws with it. You can tell, like some of the disjointed, disjointed nature of that initial scene between um, Rio and Shenhua as they're walking to the village. It's, I'm partly to blame for that because I, I, I really strongly convinced them to remove the gameplay sections from that. So I remember that that, that debate pretty, pretty clearly. Interesting, yeah. Because consequently, it's the only section of the game that has that. 
And the rest yes. of it, it fits in that normal Shenmue mold. And it was, it was a point of discussion within the community as to why that was there. So I'm, I'm quite pleased you sort of alluded to, to that in some respects, because it's it's also interesting that he took that, he obviously took that on board based on your experiences. And it's, it sounds like you have a really good working relation with, relation, I can't speak, you can speak anymore, working relationship mm-hmm. with him. Yeah, exactly. yeah, we have a really, 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 I think, healthy work relationship mm. where, and it's something that I've nurtured over time too, that because I think about my work, right, where I work with people that have feedback for a game that I'm directing and, and I don't generally like to work with people who just want to bark out their opinions on games and what, mm. what about that, especially what they don't like, like, oh, this sucks or like, I don't like this or whatever. I'm like, hey, if you can't communicate, and, and, and the team at Camouflage is really good at this, by the way. They're really, really good at communicating their ideas. But I've worked with people in the past where I'm like, you know what? Even if this person has a really good piece of feedback, I'd rather not work with them because it's just so negative all the time, right? So I'm very conscious of that. And I try to make sure that I balance out my my, my criticism with with um, affirmation for the stuff that I'm seeing that the development team's doing. And I think that's it's allowed me to build trust with him over the years. Yeah, and, it's, and, and respect, I think, as well for your for your view, your opinions on, on on the game itself, and vice versa. I think, and it's it's nice that you can have that working relationship where it's built on that that respect for each other, and that when you when you do point something out, it's coming from a place at the right place, if you know what I'm, I'm saying, rather than just constantly being negative, negative, negative. It's coming from a place that actually will aid the game and and hopefully improve it. You're right, and it's funny that you mentioned it's coming from a good place, right? Is that both with Yu Suzuki and with Fumito Ueda, it took years and years and years to prove to them that I am who I am, who I say I am, which Mm. is I'm just a fan and I want to help and I'm willing to do this for free and I'm willing to put in the hours to help uh, and I'll be with you through good times and bad times, but I want you to be successful and that's why I'm there. And it's just like such a weird pitch. Like people are like, why would you do this? Like, why <laughs> why are you paying for your flights to help come over here? Why are you doing like, I invent uh, at one point I invited uh, Yu Suzuki and Harry to my home in Seattle, and I sat sat him down. This is very early, this is before the, the the Kickstarter campaign, and I spent a whole day um, catching Yu Suzuki up with modern video gaming. And can you imagine as a fan of his, uh, you know, going back to like Virtual Fighter and Space Harrier, that I've got Yu Suzuki on my couch here. And I'm showing him what GTA 4 is, and Destiny, and Heavy Rain, and Wolf Among Us, and all these games that he influenced heavily, right? Mm. Uh, and I mean, it was that was one of the points where he was asking, "It's like, well, like, why are you doing this again?" And I just have to <laughs> keep reminding him that I'm I'm doing this because I, I care deeply about him and the and the community and the, and this franchise. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. It's it's, it's a love. For the franchise and his work at the end of the day and it's i think it's what drives this community forward and actually it sort of comes into my next question around sort of the future of shenmue if you like obviously sure. there's there's the message in in the game from yuzuzuki that the, the fate of shenmue 4 is back in the fans hands uh, mm. to some degree at least anyway i we don't know what's going on behind the scenes necessarily but is, is there any advice you could give to the community for obviously working with users who can be involved for such a long time? Is there any advice you can give the community to say, you know, this is, you know, keep pushing, Shenmue 4 can happen. Is there anything, any sort of advice, guidance you could give us around that? Hmm. Well, I mean, for starters, this, that's a, that message at the end of Shenmue 3 is, an ex, is, is another example of something that he and I worked on together. Uh, I remember when I played a uh, pre-release version of the game. Uh, it just ended, and I said, "You saw you we you gotta say something at the end of this thing. This has been a long journey, right, for the fans." And, uh, and he's like, "Yeah, you're right, you're right." And uh, and, he, and he he wrote that message, and, uh, and and I worked on the English version of it. Uh, and I really I'm really really happy he did that. And, uh, to me as a fan, I think it really helped. Um, yeah, give it, give me hope for that this, this franchise is going to continue. But to answer your question, Matt, um, my advice to the community is that kind of in the same way that I talk about the feedback that I give you, son, in the, in the way I communicate with him, which is uh, having a good balance of the good and the bad, yeah. is that I think if you want to be hypercritical of Shenmue 3, you have many justified reasons for that right i think if somebody and people have they've created youtube videos where they just destroy the game and again i think a lot of their criticisms are completely valid 
Um, but as as for for fans of the series and as, as and and who want to see more, right? I think it really behooves them to, as much as possible, have a balanced perspective on it and try to try to stay optimistic and try to stay positive and focus on on many of the uh, successes of that game. Which one of them you brought up, Matt, is the fact that from a development perspective, this thing is a damn miracle that they did not start with the code base of Shemu one and two. He recreated him and his team recreated so many complex systems from Shemu one and two in a new engine that they've never used before on a platform they've never shipped on. Um, and they delivered on a game, I think that had more features and more length than anybody was ever expecting. Um, and in that it should be um, celebrated. And I think a reason to be hopeful for the future is that if there is an opportunity to work on a sequel to build a Shemu four, Presumably, the team is going to be working on that code base, and so they can spend, instead of spending 70% of their time building the foundation and then 30% of the time building the content, they can spend 80% of their time building content for a sequel and not having to worry about building that foundation. And that is the secret ingredient, by the way, of almost all the best video games of all time, is that they are either explicitly or implicitly sequels. They're built on the past successes from those dev teams. Uh, and uh, and that's why I have a lot of hope that, you know, if, if there is an opportunity to build a sequel, that it will be much improved over, yeah. the, over the third installment. And, and what you're saying is that it's something we've, we've talked about in the community quite a lot is, is that the basics, you know, the, the, the mechanics are there, the codes there, that you've got character models there. All of that hard work is done in terms of, the, mm -hmm. the core game itself it's then really drilling into the the, the story of Shenmue you know, what Shenmue 4 may be it's really drilling into that content as you say and really giving it that that real effort to to step it up it's a bit like Shenmue 1 and 2 in my in my opinion that Shenmue 1 is the you're foundation right, right. and then Shenmue 2 blows it out of the water and I, exactly. I from my point of view I, I'm, I have the confidence in, in Yu Suzuki and the team that they can do it again with Shenmue 4, that, that Shenmue 3 is the basis and Shenmue 4 will take that to another level. That's, that's yeah, my humble I, opinion. You're, I, think, I think you're 100% right, Matt. And, and he and I have spent a lot of time looking at the critiques of the, of the third game <laughs> and talking about how he would uh, address each, each and every one of those critiques uh, if he were to have the opportunity to work on a sequel. So he's, he's well aware, I think. And I, that's really hard, by the way, as a, as a creator whether you're working on a game that's perceived as a failure or success or somewhere in the middle, right? Is to really take a close look at, uh, at the critiques of, of the thing that you've worked and poured so much of your life into and then uh, applied those lessons to your future thinking. Uh, I have the utmost respect for him and his ability to do that. Excellent. I think the community would be quite, quite excited actually to hear that he's listening to those critiques and they are valid uh, at the end of the day. I mean, mm -hmm. I loved the game for what it was, but they are valid. And it's good that he, you know, from, from our point of view, that he's listening to those and taking yes. those on board and has an idea of what he wants to do next. I think that, and I think he said that in an IGN Japan interview um, earlier this year, he started talking about Shenmue 4 and what he wants to change and improve. So he's all, he's having those thoughts now, which is fantastic, I think. Yeah. And talking about the future of the franchise i'll touch on it briefly because i also want to sure. talk to you about iron man vr and things I'm, I'm, I'm aware we're running out of time um because obviously shenmue anime um came out of nowhere <laughs> for one of mm. a better expression um I, for me personally i think it's it's another really good arm to the franchise i think it could really entice new people in what what are you what's your take on the anime from what you you may or may not know about it do, do you think it could really aid the franchise going forward uh to both first of all I, I should be honest that i don't i'm not intimately familiar with the project i, I knew about it before it was announced obviously mm. um and yeah i don't even i, I should be careful because i'm not even sure how much has been announced publicly about it so um, let me just say that for, for as far as i'm concerned any any high quality Shimu content, whether it's a game or it's anime, it's a manga or what, what, what have you, I think is a good thing, right? And I'm always gonna be supportive of that. Um, and, but I will say, and this is just my personal opinion, that I, while I would gladly accept future installments of the Shimu franchise be communicated through a, not a game. Yeah. I 
highly prefer it to be communicated through a game. And I, I want Shenmue 4, the video game, right? I want Shenmue 5, the video game. Um, but that, again, but I think having more extensions of the franchise, like the anime, I think is great and um, super, super excited for it. I, yeah, I think actually from the, what has been revealed, it looks like a truly faithful recreation. I'm glad that Yu Suzuki himself is obviously his executive producer, so he's quite hands-on yeah. with it. And I think that's the thing. It's the per- yeah, They're not going to... It's not an open interpretation of the story, but they can go about it their own way with guidance from what Yu Suzuki is wanting to do with it. And it's, I'd be interested to see what, what comes out of it at the other end. I think it's generated a lot of hype, rightly so, um, and I'd be very, very intrigued to see where it come, where it goes. Also, you've got to think that in terms of like merchandise for it, if it goes to Blu-ray or DVD. Mm. Um, and as you know, Shenmue fans tend to lap up merchandise like it's going out of they fashion do. anyway. <laughs> yes. It's on sale yep. for about 10 minutes and it's gone. I want to move away from Shenmue for the last few minutes because you're not just all about Shenmue. You have your own studio, Camouflage, which obviously... Um, released Iron Man VR this year and I, ha- I have to confess I haven't played it because I don't own PlayStation VR at the moment but it came out to critical acclaim so what inspired you to take Iron Man to the VR realms? Well um, yeah well first of all yeah thanks for asking about the game yeah that's that that is my daytime job is to work on uh, to, to lead the charge over at Camouflage which is home to about 50 60 developers now and uh just a great team, and we were we were given the opportunity to work on a on a on a Marvel VR pl- um, uh, property that uh, that we came back and pitched them on, saying, "Hey, you know what? If we were to work with a Marvel property in VR, we couldn't think of a better superhero to work with than Iron Man." And uh, through a, a much a long story that's probably way way beyond what we have the time to, to talk about. Um, we were able to broker a, a, a relationship with with Marvel through um, a really amazing prototype that the team at Camouflage and Darkwind built. And from then on, it was just like this roller coaster ride uh, for several years of just learning what VR is all about, um, learning what the essence of that character is, trying to map the best things about Iron Man with the best things about um, the with uh, with VR, whether it's flying or shooting or ground pounding or rocket punching, and then also just telling a story through the the power of the VR medium um, as, as playing as Tony Stark, who's kind of his own worst enemy. And we told a story about that. So like I said, it was a whirlwind development. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe that it's already over. Um, Cause you just, just, just like I'm sure it was for Yu Suzuki you worked on Shenmue three for so many years. And then all of a sudden you're just not working on it anymore and you got to move on. And I'm still, I think I'm kind of in that, that post launch um, phase where um, I miss working on it, but I'm really proud of what the team built. Um, but I'm really excited about what what we have um, what we have in the in the oven for our next project. I'm going to touch on that in a minute, actually, um, about your next project. Obviously, what you can and can't say. I, I'm just interested in VR, actually. Obviously, Iron Man VR was you know, critical success, and I think it's done so, from what I understand, sales wise, it's done really, really well. Where do you think VR fits as a sort of a, a medium within gaming going forward? I, I really hope that VR is an important aspect of, of, of the way that we play games moving forward. Um, I don't, I'm not one of those people, and I think those people are starting to diminish over time. I don't think that VR is going to take over, right? I don't think like in the mm-hmm. future it's like it's gonna, only going to be VR games. But, uh, but I do think that through games such as Half-Life Alex or Resident Evil 7 or... Tetris Effect, Res Infinite, Saints and uh, Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners, and literally now dozens of other games. I think you could say have like really proven that VR is a powerful medium when utilized correctly, and not only from a visceral perspective of having the player's actions one to one with your player character and what that affords you in virtual reality and the immersion of it is not only extremely powerful, but when paired with storytelling. You can do some really amazing things that just aren't, in my opinion, um, as potent as they are um, on on the flat screen. And so I'm just um, I'm the biggest I'm the world's biggest cheerleader for Sony and Oculus and and Valve and HTC and all the all the all the players in VR right now to just keep it going because I know it's an expensive investment and I know the returns probably haven't been as high as they that the analysts probably told them it would be many years ago. Um, but as a player and as a as a 
as a fan of the game industry, um, I think that the work that developers are doing and the platform holders are doing in VR is very, very important because I think the future is really, really bright for when the technology gets continues to get better, when developers continue to learn VR uh, more and more, and and as more amazing like IP like like Iron Man for example are coming into VR, um, I think that players are in store for some really incredible experiences down the road, and I I just uh, I just can't wait for for that day to for to see more content like that. And I think you're right. I think it is coming. Um, and VR has it's had a patchy history if you go all the way through gaming <laughs> all the way back, shall we say? But I oh think yeah. This this generation of VR with, with certainly with the PlayStation VR, Oculus, which are, I know you said that there, there are investment in terms of the hardware, but actually the quality of the content is that much higher that I think people now are interested in it and they're thinking, yeah. what, what what's the deal with VR? What you know, and they get it and then they get captivated by it because you can get you can get encapsulated in what that game is trying to deliver to you. And I think you're right. I think as as it goes on, as technology gets better, as developers get more familiar with what they're trying to do with it, I do think that actually, from a from a story perspective, it's it, it will really enhance that that experience for the player, whatever game that may be. And I think it's a bit of a sleeping giant in some respects, in, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right, Matt. And uh, let's just hope that platform holders, developers, consumers, we all just kind of keep keep stay committed. Mm. Um, because as you said, it's been kind of patchy and I think that we're on the, on a really encouraging upswing and we just have to keep this momentum going. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. My last question, because I know, um, we're just about to the top of the hour is I, uh, without obviously giving too much away, uh, what, what projects do you have in the pipeline at Camouflage? Is there anything that you can talk about going into the new console generations? Uh, yeah, I mean, I wish I could say, I think that let's just, let's just say that the team at Camouflage and our development partners at Darkwind um, hit the ground running after shipping Marvel's Iron Man VR. Um, not only because we're really passionate about what we're doing next, but because we kind of had to, given the, the state of the world. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of doing team surveys, uh, as the team would tell you. And I, I, I would send out lots of surveys asking them on a pretty regular basis. Uh, how are they feeling right now post-launch? I mean, you must be tired. You must be wanting to take a vacation. Like, are you going to take a vacation? Because if you are, like, it might be more of like a staycation than it is going to be like in a tropical environment with a, you know, with an umbrella in your in your drink. Uh, and I wasn't surprised to see that a lot of the team members um, decided that they're going to maybe take a long weekend here and there and mm -hmm. recharge the batteries, but they're going to wait um, a while until the world starts to get back to a place where it's safer to travel. Uh, and that's when they're going to take their real vacations. So what's going on within the walls of, of camouflage and, and dark wind is that we're just working so diligently on, on the new project, taking lessons from what we learned from Iron, Marvel's Iron Man, Iron Man VR, experimenting with new things. And um, yeah, I think the future is really, really bright for the company. It sounds I'm um... I'm looking forward to when you announce it. Obviously, you can't give us a time scale on it, um, but if it's anything like Iron Man VR, I think I think the uh, gaming world should be excited. Actually, I think I, I I hold I haven't played it yet, but I've read all the critical acclaim and I, I've spoken to James who's who's got it. Um, oh great! He, he he absolutely loves VR anyway, and he said Iron Man VR is is is, is right up there, one of his favourites. So I will eventually invest in VR and I will be picking it up because I love Iron Man, I love Marvel. <laughs> Um, oh, outside good. outside of Shenmue and games, so I think I think it's yeah. I, the job you did on it, from what I've seen, it is absolutely stellar in my opinion. Oh, um, thank you. So I think the I studio should be should be really really proud. Right, they I'm gonna be. I'm gonna let you go because we're at the top of the hour. I'm sure you you're a busy man with lots of other people wanting wanting your your attention. So it leaves me to say thank you for your time. Um, I appreciate you taking the hour to talk to me about Shenmue 3, talk to me about camouflage and sort of your history in, in, in gaming itself. And yeah, I think the community will be thrilled to hear some of the things we talked about. So yeah, from from the bottom of my heart and the community, thank you so much. I, I deeply appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. And um, yeah, maybe in, in closing, uh, you know, I just want to thank you and and and, and the community for, for the, your hard work and dedication um, to the to the franchise i know being a shamu fan is not always easy right <laughs> no. uh, there's some really great and exciting days and there's a lot but 
there's probably more days where there's despair and uncertainty and uh and and but despite that that the that fact so much of your community is hung around there there's also new fans too which is great and hopefully the anime will bring in even more fans um but i think you know what i was talking about earlier i think if there's any if there's like just one takeaway that i could leave with is that and i know a lot of your t- your community already knows this but again i think it's like having like a really delicate and healthy balance of of positivity and 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 also, you know, a critical eye to the franchise, um, because as you know, so much, so sometimes, you know, communities can just devolve into negativity. I'm not, and I actually think that one of the great things about Shimu Dojo is it's overall like a quite positive community. Um, and so, but I also don't think you want to have like a community that's completely blind to the, to the flaws and the mistakes that are made um, yeah, throughout absolutely. the way. Right. So, um, I think just, I just want to encourage your group to continue what they're doing, which is, um, being, it's okay to be excited. It's okay to have hopes and dreams and be optimistic about things, but it's also okay to, to, to call a spade a spade at times. And so um, that's something I've always appreciated about the community and, um, and congratulations on the big anniversary too. It's unbelievable. You guys have been around for, for that long. And it's, it's scary that we've been, I mean, me and James took it over in, in July. So it's only a very small part of the history, broader history, if you like, but yeah, it's, it's, it's mind blowing that, I signed up for the dojo probably 17 years ago and you never you don't <laughs> think of it at the time, do you? But 20 years has disappeared and I'm now in my thirties yeah, still, in, still involved and still doing all of it. And yeah, it, it, it's fantastic. I think you're right. I think what you say is very, very true. I think that what the community try to foster is a healthy balance between positive praise where it's deserved and constructive criticisms. And that's where I think sometimes I think we're all guilty of it that there's an overreaction to things, especially negative things, especially in this day and age with the internet and how things travel. But I think that we try to foster a good balance between that constructive criticism that we we all discuss and we want to talk about and we want to get out in the open, but doing it in a respectful manner, I think is the biggest bugbear I have. Totally. Criticise somebody all you want, but please be respectful. I think that's the one thing that I've always been taught is if you're going to, criticize do it in a respectful manner and don't just hone in on those negative aspects take a wider view and see actually what the whole package is if you like i think we're birds of a feather uh me you and and your community at large because the internal three pillars of camouflage are being open honest and respectful right and we don't want to hear your your critiques or your frustrations if you can't do it in a respectful manner and i think as long as yeah you guys are adhering to those those core principles it's there's another 20 years of excitement to be looking forward to for Shemu Dojo, I think.